Thanks, Alicia. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, Leanne and I met uh, about a year ago in London during London Tech Week, uh, where my team was running an, an event on the aspiration, responsibility, and trust in the digital age. And Leanne was uh, joining us on stage over there. Uh, we had some fantastic conversations there. For those of you who don't know, Leanne was uh, recently named uh, 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 top 50 women uh, in technology globally, one of the top 50 women in technology yeah. uh, globally by Forbes magazine. So congratulations on this one, uh, on this one, Leanne. Thanks, Mary. Uh, well done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's quite a quite a big feat uh, among the top. It is. 50. Yes, it is. Um, what we're going to do in this conversation, we want to talk about the Australia's digital ecosystem. We're going to sort of uh, group it in three, three areas. We'll start with a bit of uh, entrepreneurship, uh, and Leanne has a great story to share there. Uh, then we'll talk a bit more uh, also about working with government and, and what's happening in this space, and we'll finish off on the more of an academic uh, note as well. Now, uh, Leanne, uh, uh, one of the things that you do uh, is you're the CEO of Everledger. Uh, tell us a bit more about what Everledger is, what do you do? So Everledger began in the heart of London in 2014, 2015. Um, and geez, these space guys are pretty popular, aren't they, in fact? In fact, I remember in late 2014, I was about as popular as Madonna was in the 80s as well, when no one really understood what blockchain was. Um, suffice to say, I took the very best of emerging technologies, blockchain, smart contracts, and machine vision, and applied that to the diamond supply chain. The ability to be able to track diamonds from the source of the mine right the way through to the retail network to ensure that we know where diamonds come from. How can we answer the question, has it been mined ethically? Who has been involved in the manufacturing? Has it actually transcended the correct trading channels? And finally, a consumer can ask the question, a full consciousness decision about whether that diamond, emerald, ruby or sapphire is really something that they want to purchase. So this is, this is quite big, right? We're talking about blood diamonds right now. We're talking about potentially preventing any trade uh, in blood diamonds. Uh, your technology is, uh, is, is allowing for it. It is. We have about 2.2 million diamonds now on the ledger. Um, and in 2016, we began to extend into colored gemstones, so emeralds, rubies, and sapphires. And as we stand here today, I ask myself the question, not just about the diamond supply chain, but think about what could be the future's most conflicted supply chain in the world. And when I took a moment to understand that question a little deeper, it's batteries. The reality is that every device that's on the planet today, nearly every house that is driven by solar panels will have to store energy in some form. And if we unpick the supply chain, the battery supply chain, it's cobalt and lithium. And cobalt, 80% of the world's cobalt is mined in the Congo DRC, where children as young as six and 10 are mining for these minerals. So we began that journey earlier this year. And in fact, this afternoon, I traveled to Davos where I'm leading the Global Battery Alliance to ensure that we can take the very best of these new forms of technology and to apply it and bring transparency to opaque supply chains globally. Mm. So you started your business in, in London. That's where Everledger is headquartered. Yeah. But at the same time, you're spending quite a lot of time in Australia, quite a lot of time in Brisbane, in Queensland. <laughs> Why is that? What, what makes Australia, Queensland, Brisbane uh, so special for you for Everledger? Well, firstly, Brisbane is my home and um, I have cows and they need feeding some days. So I guess you've got to get home to do that. <laughs> but no, more seriously, um, look, we are solving for a global problem. And for us, we need to attract the very best um, diversity of talent. And of course, London is a hotspot for talent. So too is Germany and so too is Silicon Valley. But it's really the, the convergence of, um, of a very good diversity team, which might come from certain types of um, thinking and backgrounds, and we can bring that together to sort of challenge ourselves. In 2010, I think it was, the Queensland government decided to stamp themselves as a smart state of Australia. And it was very clear that the DNA of Queenslanders and Australians 
know that it's important not to innovate just for the sake of innovation. We live in a country that is harsh. And of course, climate set is upon us, and it was only last month where we had raging fires in north of Queensland, and only four hours drive south of where I was, we were completely flooded. And this is the world that we live in day in, day out. So we know and understand adversity. And we know and understand that technology needs to be applied to solve certain problems. So when we reach out to entrepreneurs in Australia, we typically are there to solve real world challenges rather than just innovating and tinkering with technology for the sake of it being fun and exciting. Mm, mm. So that was your move from, uh, from London to Brisbane. In a way, it's not, you know, it's not a proper move. You're, you're almost in every, every place there. I think it's I can a, relate to it. Oh. It's a bloody long swim. <laughs> it is a bloody <laughs> long swim. But um, um, there's a rumor that you actually moved Silicon Valley to Brisbane, so. That's right, so, so, so almost five years ago, I moved from, uh, from a small place in, in Silicon Valley called Mountain View uh, to, to Brisbane. Uh, and you know, I never looked back. Uh, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm there in Silicon Valley as often as I can be uh, a few times a year because uh, that's where a lot of things are happening at the same time I really believe that my place at the moment is, is in Australia uh, for similar reasons that, that you mentioned right now. The, the one interesting thing that is happening in Australia is there are some very interesting large challenges that the country, that the continent needs to cope with. We have Great Barrier Reef that you know, we need to understand how to prevent the coral bleaching. And we work with teams at my university, at Queensland University of Technology, on actually developing uh, robotic solutions that help protect the coral reef. Uh, we have problems like drought. We have uh, amazing developments when it comes to the applications of solar uh, uh, and, and photovoltaic technologies. All of that is requiring people who are interested in, in developing digital solutions to actually provide those solutions. And it could be in the space of blockchains where we're looking into developing markets where solar uh, power producers get to exchange that energy without uh, the intermediate party that would be uh, a power, an energy retailer, so kind of peer-to-peer -peer networking. Look, and, and not only that, I think in Australia, we're the largest island in the world or the smallest continent. And so for us, we think and we know and understand that it's incredibly expensive to be able to export goods, even yeah. though we have an incredible trade relationship with China. Um, Australia as a whole, Queensland more intimately, is exploring circular economy. What can we do to onshore? How can we ensure that the survival of our state and of course our country um, goes well beyond the generation that sits today? So these new economic models that are really coming out to be able to combine uh, emerging technologies, thinking about the natural resources we have, are there ways, instead of proudly Queensland being the largest extraction state where we have cobalt, oh, sorry, where we have cobalt in the Northern Hemisphere, where we have a number of coal mines, is there a way to think about unlocking the value of urban mining? So is these types of conversations where the government truly understands what it means to sort of plumb the future? So GDP could also be measured um, in ways that hasn't been seen before in the last sort of 10 to 15 years. It's, a, it's an interesting challenge of uh, what we call connected disconnectedness. So, so on the digital level, uh, we can be all connected, but in places like Australia, in places like Queensland, there's a lot of communities that are disconnected and that ability to develop uh, uh, self-sufficiency in all sorts of ways, uh, whether it's local mining, whether it's local production of resources, is an interesting challenge, uh, which is very different from, from a lot of places around the world. Uh, Liam, I wanted to, to change the, uh, the topic a tiny bit. Um, a couple of months ago, we had a conversation and uh, you, know, you used a, a concept that I, that I found, found very exciting. You talked about human checksum. Uh, human checksum, I'll say, you know, concept in the digital space. Do you want to, to explain to, to all of us what, what you meant by that? Yeah, look, I, look, I'm a software engineer and have sat behind a keyboard for 20 five years of my career, so now I'm giving away my age a little bit. Um, and for me, it's interesting. I work in the space of blockchain and smart contracts and AI and machine vision, and I'm, I'm still hands-on in engineering. And what's fascinating to me is to understand and think about the, the future of skills, not necessarily the future of jobs. And when I contemplate the role of humans, um, 
25 years ago, we were using spreadsheets uh, and a checksum formula to be able to check if the work I was doing on my calculator was adding up correctly. And now, of course, we're starting to transcend into the world of AI and robotics, where ultimately the human will become the checksum for algorithms. You know, we will start to say, this doesn't make sense, this doesn't feel right. These sort of soft skills as human beings will start to kick in. And it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting thought pattern. And it's actually come to life in my company. Uh, I rang up a previous engineer that I'd worked with. He's 77 years of age. I asked his wife if he could come out of retirement and join me. And the reason why I wanted him to join Everledger was because I knew that he had a situation awareness about how and where types of technologies like robotics and AI were able to be placed in the real world. We have incredible engineers in our company, 75 in our team, and some of them are very young, you know, very experienced in terms of PhD and came out of the best universities in the world. But to put them in situational awareness where the technology is on the production line, actually that's the experience of someone who has lived this for 30 or 40 years, to know how a robot is to actually interact on a production line in advanced manufacturing is actually a soft skill that will, let, will be incredibly important to burn out efficiency over time. Got it. Uh, so the way I, I see it is uh, Steve Jobs uh, uh, said a long time ago that the computer is like a bicycle for your mind. Sometimes these days we don't know who's the bicycle, who's the rider, right? So there are you know, technologies that we, we almost don't have a control over and this is where the checksum could also be, be coming in place. Leanne, you're a Queensland chief entrepreneur. Uh, you were named Queensland chief entrepreneur a couple of months ago. Who is a chief entrepreneur? <laughs> So it's, a, it's an honorary role uh, that's appointed by the Premier of the state. And I mentioned before, Queensland is a very proud and deep heritage. Um, in fact, the government is the largest employer of public service uh, in, in all of Queensland. We're also the largest in terms of export. And the government has recognised that the status quo, what we did yesterday is not going to survive for us today and certainly next generation we need to rethink the paradigm. The Queensland Government about three years ago decided to invest $600 million in entrepreneurship, innovation, startup and build and be very serious about ecosystems. Now we've seen a number of governments attempt to do this and have done this, but where Queensland is really leading the charge is really not in the hard infrastructure, even though we have magical buildings and yep, we get beer on tap and yes, there's bean bags, but actually where the government has really enabled the change is to understand the soft skilling, the soft infrastructure, the fact that the government has recognised that it needs to have entrepreneurship driven at the very core of its education system, that we have we have um, kidpreneur programs where we're talking to children in, in as young as grade four, that universities are heavily engaged as a part of their curriculum activity and they create not only the infrastructure but the learnings around what it means to be an entrepreneur. Now I, I subscribe to, it's interesting for me because no one has ever given me a real job. I'm actually unemployable. I'm a serial entrepreneur and I've started a number of companies and I've exited them. So I've seen the light and the day and I've seen, um, I've seen the success and the failures. Um, but there is this, still this mystical, magical moment where certain parts of ecosystems it's like a David Attenborough movie. We you know when you walk in, you see and see the startups in their natural habitat as they <laughs> feed and forage amongst themselves. And I think we've really transcended beyond that because it's not necessarily about the entrepreneur being a strange creature in a certain habitat. And Queensland really has understood that the diversity of thought and the appetite for risk just sits within the veins um, of the blood system uh, within, the, within the state. 
and I can uh, uh, I can confirm that uh, it's an interesting strategy that the government has. Uh, when I moved uh, to uh, to Brisbane from Silicon Valley, uh, back in Silicon Valley, I worked for for SAP, right, a large large software enterprise software business. Uh, in Brisbane, I'm a professor at a university, and that role has basically been created in partnership with Queensland government, in uh, partnership with a local um, uh, government uh, in Brisbane, in partnership with PwC. So it's almost like a triangle of academia, government, and industry, all of them getting together. And because you know the center, the headquarters is at a university, that enables having uh, a very relaxed conversations where you know all of the partners don't feel like there's an agenda or there's a vendor trying to sell solutions to them. Uh, and so we've been doing quite a bit in this space, uh, you know, thanks to partnerships yeah. like that, we can ex explore super exciting topics such as you know, economy of algorithms. What does it mean when, you know, it's algorithms making decisions for us? Do we need a human checksum to, you know, to, uh, uh, in such situations? It's not only a world of B2B and B2C, but it's also a world of B2A or A to C, so business to algorithm or algorithm to customer so all those you know uh, uh, all those uh, those initiatives have been uh, made possible by uh, uh, by really the support of the of the government which is a very yeah, I mean, one part of the illumination that's happened quite quickly if you are a if you're a startup or an entrepreneur it's not the funding that's hard and even sometimes it's not the team that's hard it's finding the first customer to prove market entry fit um, and so from my perspective when I became deeply engaged with the government knowing the size and the power of their spend and understanding some of the challenges that governments have globally you know it's a procurement first policy how can we engage with the government in such a way that it recognizes young companies that might be a year old um, that potentially anyone could see them as a balance sheet risk but if they've actually been selected as a part of a certain type of an entrepreneur program they've come through some reputable universities you know they have an MVP that's been written then enable the government to see that as a positive step forward to have engagement rather than wait for the company or go back to the old, old SAPs of the world which often just get written the cheque because they're SAP. And that would really be one of the biggest sort of um, enzyme changes we're starting to see, particularly in Queensland and I'm quite sure there'll be a splinter effect across, across Australia. There's a term you use uh, quite often, Leanne, uh, uh, you say smart ups instead of startups. What do you mean by this? <laughs> yeah, look, I think, you know, we have startups and we have scale ups and um, there's something in the middle that is beyond funding and, um, and, and beyond the hopes and dreams of getting the right board and the right level of investors. And it's an incredible, um, it's an incredible articulation of timing and to ensure that you have the right technology with the right partners, with the right funding um, to solve our, for a problem that is a challenging situation that isn't just about today and isn't about a single layer technology implementation. And it's this type of potent formula that when you can charge that off the tail end of a powerful base like Australia, then I think you'll start to see um, you know, within the next five to 10 years, you'll start to see some headline unicorns coming out of our, our part of the world. So some of the um, um, some of the the points from the conversations that we would like you uh, to 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 remember and and think about is uh, that Australia uh, has its its specifics and uh, and it's all about uh, very unusual, very interesting challenges that uh, uh, that can be addressed by by entrepreneurs, by people in the digital space. Uh, when it comes to partnerships, uh, there are also quite interesting opportunities there, and uh, uh, just like the governments uh, in Australia. Whether it's federal, state, or local governments, are quite uh, open to those those partnerships. There are also interesting organisations uh, to work with, and uh, a lot of us, a lot of us, recognise um, you know Australia as an interesting place to run their businesses from, uh, for at least those two reasons. Not sure, Leanne, if you would like to add yeah, anything. The other else. thing that's interesting is sort of you know 70 or 80 percent of our entire population is along the coastline because pretty much in the middle of Australia is a great big arid desert but 
when I actually look at the footprint of entrepreneurship and innovation, about 40% of our startups and entrepreneurs and innovators are actually happening in regional Queensland. So not necessarily in the middle of the city. And the reason for that is they're solving for real problems. You know, there is drought. People and animals are dying. There is a problem with water, there is scarcity. So these problems are not just first world problems being contained within the large city where funding, of course, is plentiful. This is every day. They're looking down the barrel of a problem that is not a nice to be solved, it's a have to be solved. And so these are really sort of interesting, um, you know, interesting dynamics that you don't necessarily see across the world in other places problems worth solving. We're working with the, the DLD team right now on exploring opportunities of bringing some of the, the, the DLD activities also to Australia. So stay tuned when it comes to it, but perhaps uh, at some stage, maybe this year, maybe next year, we might see you in Australia uh, at a, a DLD branded event there. Let's see, let's see how it goes. Yeah, we'd love to have you there. Uh, Leanne, Just don't come all at once because that's a really expensive beer tab. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining me, Leanne. Thanks, no uh, uh, thanks for staying with us uh, and enjoy the rest of the night today. Thank you. Thank you.